going to say good morning, but it's actually good afternoon. Um, it's great to see you all. It's great to be back and to be in a room with people actually sitting on the chairs is a real, a real pleasure. Um, uh, you're all very welcome. Um, there's only one announcement. Margaret has uh, kindly knitted, must have been hundreds of dishcloths, so there's some here up at the front and they're a pound each if you want, anybody wants any dishcloths. Christmas presents early, I don't know. Um, many of you know um, I love flowers and plants and over the last lot of weeks I have weeks and weeks and weeks I have been uh, spending a bit more time in my garden. I think Murray has some photographs they might want to to share. I've been planting pots, I've been planting vegetables, uh, herbs, also some seeds as well. And um, Sean, my husband, he's always very good at presents. And recently he brought me a present. I thought it was for our wedding anniversary, because that was a couple of weeks ago. He bought me this shiny new spade shovel for the garden. And I thought about it. I thought, well, yes, it's, it's lovely and it's nice and deep, but this is the one that I had been using. So I thought, you know, this did equally as well. And actually I said to him, why? Why did you get me this? It's lovely and green and it's shiny, but why did you get it for me? And he says, it was more efficient, more effective. You'd be able to lift more compost or more soil and you wouldn't spill it and then you wouldn't need to uh, sweep up and everything and I thought well, that's really really kind but um, you know basically this this does the same job as this and it got me thinking this really is just a tool it's a means to an end my plants need some water and some sunlight there's, there's a picture there of sunlight somewhere and um, it needs water and sunlight for for growth and that's basically like us we need growth. But it got me thinking, and it reminded me of Paul's letter to, uh, to the church in Corinth. And when he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. We're going to sing our first song this morning is How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Let's sing.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to gather here today to hear your word and praise your holy name. Heavenly Father, you hold all things together from the smallest seed to the largest tree. Thank you for the beauty around us. Thank you for the complexity of life within us. Thank you for growth, for renewal, for breath. Father, our daily routines can be busy, and sometimes we forget to stop and thank you for all that is good in our lives. So much going on in the world and on our televisions that we can become overloaded and worried. Help us to count our blessings for the gift of living, for the ability to love and to be loved. Lord, help us especially when we feel stretched and challenged and things are difficult. We feel hurt. You are as near to us as our next breath, and in the middle of those storms, we are growing in you. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Our next um, song this morning is What a Fellowship. Our reading today is from Nehemiah, and it's uh, chapter 1, Report from Jerusalem. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Halkali. Now it happened in the month of Cheslif, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned, 
We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, I was a cupbearer to the king. Amen. We're now going to sing again, I have a shepherd. Folks, it's uh, really good to see you again. Uh, just to remind you that after the service, if you wouldn't mind going out uh, through this door, uh, and if you can go out immediately, and then you can chat outside. It's safer for you to chat outside, if that's okay. So as soon as the service is over, it would be good uh, to see you out. The second thing I want to say is, I'm absolutely delighted to see Stephen. We have been praying for Stephen for months and months and months. Stephen has gone through a really tough time. 
and he's looking really well, isn't he? So, Stephen, thanks very much for coming. It's great. I, when I heard that he was up, I just thought, when the breakout came to the service, now, I know what you're thinking. He doesn't look 70, and he's definitely not 70, but just, I was delighted he was in Belfast, and so delighted to have him come to the service. It's so that uh, we had an opportunity to praise God for him, and for folk to see him, and uh, to see him looking so well. And the third thing is, I generally really enjoy Suzanne leading the service. Uh, when she leads, uh, it helps me to draw closer to God. I really appreciate uh, she has a real gifting uh, for, for leading, and, and, and we're delighted then that she is so willing to do that in so many times. But there's one thing that she's not very good at. And, oh, first of all, the thing is she's not good at, she's not good to understand. Sean bought that because it was half price in Asda. That's why he bought it. He might have said it's because it holds more soil. The man saw a half price and that's why he bought it. And, uh, but actually the thing she's not good at is, and therefore she would never get a job at this. I don't know if you ever watch, is it, I don't have Sky TV, but if you watch, um, most TVs have it now, it's a channel called QVC. Have you ever seen the QVC channel? The QVC channel, just sells. It sells 24-7, and, and it sells all sorts of things. And uh, so I think they have a week in July that they sell Christmas presents. And so the time to buy your Christmas present was in July there. Uh, and so they sell say, all sorts of things. And um, when I heard the pitch, when I heard a pitch about this, I thought, if, if she worked for QVC, she'd be sacked. She'd be getting her P45 because she said, there's dishcloths there. If you're interested in buying a dishcloth, they're a pound and the money goes to Marie Curie. What she should have been saying, do you know what this is? This is a bundle of joy. This is the most important thing that you can have in your house. Some people might use it for a dishcloth and it's probably the best dishcloth you've ever had in your life. Do you know there's nothing worse when a dishcloth gets really dirty and it doesn't wash? There's nothing worse if a dishcloth has holes in it. This has holes in it because it lets the air through so it washes your dishes far, far easier. But not only is it a dishcloth, it's a duster. You've never seen a duster like this in your life. You talk about anti-static, this has got all the static that you need and it'll clean all your dust. Once you dust your television with this, it won't need dusty for another six months. That's how good this duster is and we've got a guarantee if you buy one, you never get your money back. And so it's, it's well worth getting it. And you know, for the men in the place, do you know what this is perfect for? And when I saw it, I thought, I'm going to buy this one, by the way. And I thought, do you know what this is perfect for? See when you go to the beach and you've forgotten your sombrero or your hat. Look at that there. That is perfect. Remember years ago men had hankies and they had to tie it down because handy hankies were so light. This is the perfect weight for your head, men. And so this is why this is so men, you buy it for your head. Women, you buy it for your dusters, and men, you buy it for the washing up. That's what you have to buy. This is an all-in-one package, and it's only £4.50 normally, but today it's £1. This is the last we've got, so it's only £1. That's how you should have done it. <laughs> Folks, great to see you, and uh, you'll never know what we're going to sell next week. But uh, we're, we're going to continue to look at some of the heroes. And again, I'm really glad that Stephen is here because I've got three questions to ask. Because I'm going back to this idea of what cards would you have if you were having cards of the heroes of the faith, either in the Bible or throughout church history. And there's lots of men and there's lots of women that you would have in your collection. Some of them would be favourites to you and, and most of them would be really good to have. And I was mentioning these three men, and uh, the first man, a man I mentioned in the card, if you remember, uh, of footballers, I mean, is Peter McCoy. Does anybody know what position Peter McCoy played for Glasgow Rangers? Stephen? Oh, you disappoint me. Peter McCoy, best goalkeeper Rangers ever had. So he was a goalkeeper. What about, he's bound to get this one, what about John Gregg? Anybody? Sorry? Very close. He was a fullback. He was a defender. Nobody got past John Gregg. If you tried to get past him, then he would break your leg. He was, he was a great fullback. And then you've got Colin Steen. Colin Steen. Well done, Harry. A centre forward. He scored all the goals. 
But you couldn't have a team full of Peter McCoy's. You couldn't have a team full of John Gregg's. You couldn't have a team full of Colin Steen. They all had their place in the team. And when they played their part well, Rangers were unbeatable. They won the European Cup with those three men. They won many, many championships with those three men. They beat Celtic nearly every time when those three men were playing. But they played in their positions and they played really well. Well, one of the cards I would have is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah played a particular position and he was a leader. That's what he was good at. And, and I thought for a moment or two, we'd look at five uh, characteristics that Nehemiah had that we, we should try and, and, and copy. Five characteristics he had as, as a Christian leader. And, and, and you're probably a leader in, in some sort. You're, you're, you're maybe a leader within this church. Maybe you're involved in Kirk Session. Uh, you're maybe a leader in an organization. You're maybe a leader in your family. Maybe, maybe you have sons and daughters or or of your folk, your maybe a leadership within your family, maybe your leadership within your workplace, or maybe leadership within society. And, and therefore, as a Christian, this is how we should lead. And I wonder how we look at, at five things about Nehemiah. There's lots more we could look about Nehemiah, but there's five very quick things. The first thing is, uh, a Christian leader in society, or in workplace, or in church, needs to have a clear vision. They have to understand where God would have us go. They had to have an understanding. Nehemiah had a clear understanding that he was dissatisfied with where the nation was at present. And, and he had a vision of where they should be. So he was clearly understood the present situation and he clearly understood where they should go. And, and for us here in Strand or in your family, it's important that we realistically understand where we're at at the minute. And, and, and all of us would agree that as a society, this is not where society should be. We're in the middle of a pandemic and, and it's difficult. But not only that, is we're in a society that, that really doesn't seem to be following God. It doesn't seem to be interested in God. Look at all the homes in Sydney, nearly 3,500 homes. If everybody in Sydney came to church, there wouldn't be enough church buildings to cope with it. And yet we know that many church buildings have very few people in it. Uh, and over church quite close here, and, and they have five or six on a Sunday morning. And, and so we look at our society, and, and, and we need to be dissatisfied with where we're at. We shouldn't be thinking, well, that's where society is, but I'm just going to try my best. That's, that's not good enough. We need to recognize that our society is in an awful situation. It's interesting to note that during this pandemic, that not one leader, not one political leader, has called for us to come to pray to God. During the Second World War, there, there was a time when Churchill asked the nation to pray. And that was the time when we were at our lowest. That was the time of Dunkirk. That was the time of the Battle of Britain. And they said Dunkirk changed the way the war, the war was going. That was us at our lowest and that's when the nation was called to pray by the nation's leaders. Not once during this pandemic, not once have we heard Boris Johnson or, or anybody else call the churches or the nation to pray. I know the church leaders have called, but I'm talking about society as a whole. They haven't called us to pray. And do you know the reason for that is? God's not important to them. Praying would make no difference in their mind. And therefore, there's no point in doing it. Churchill, with all his faults, recognized that we had to turn to God when we were in trouble. Our leaders don't seem to recognize that. We need to be dissatisfied with it. Is this the way that we want our society to go on without God? And for Nehemiah, he's got a great job, a very comfortable job. He's cup bearer to the king, uh, a very responsible job. It, that job had to be somebody that the king trusted completely. And he trusted Nehemiah. So he was comfortable. He was well off. He had a great position of respect. He had no great physical or emotional needs, to be honest. But when he heard that the Jerusalem was in ruins, the temple had been rebuilt, but the walls were in ruins, and therefore Jerusalem was a wasteland as far as God's people were concerned. 
The Bible tells us he was deeply dissatisfied with the news. He was hurt to the core with the news. And it tells us that he prayed. He prayed and God gave him a vision of what he had to do. We need to be dissatisfied and we need to know what God is asking us to do in this area. Is it that we might just enjoy ourselves? Is it just that we make sure the things that we do suit us? Is that what we have to do? No. We need to see a way in which we see Sydney transformed for Jesus. We need to see a way in which Belfast is transformed for Jesus. We need to ask we say, to God, what would you have us do? What is the vision that you have for us to reach out to these folk? The second characteristic, because um, I'm trying to keep it within a half hour, so we might be two minutes late, but only two minutes, and I might not get the five points. I shouldn't have mentioned that. That was, that was your fault. If you'd done a good job. <laughs> the second thing is we need to feel deeply about our vision. We need to be convinced that this is from God and be committed to it. And, and, and he was like that. When, when he heard it, it says his heart was broken and affected his job. And so when the king, who was all important, was being served, it was, it was Nehemiah's job to serve him well. And serve him well he did. But he was so upset with the situation of his homeland. He was so upset about Zion, the city of God. He was so upset about all that was going on outside of where he was living that it showed in his face. In other words, his vision was something God gave him and he held on to it deeply. It wasn't something that he thought, well, it'd be nice if it happened. Wouldn't it be lovely if people in Sydney became Christians? But if they don't, well, that, that's okay. Wouldn't it be nice if more people came to all the churches in Sydney? Okay, it would be nice, but it's probably not going to happen. And not only that, as long as I'm okay, as long as I make sure that my family is okay and, and, and my wee church is okay, then that, that's the most important thing. He could have said, well, I need to make sure that I stay faithful to God where I am. No. His heart was where the work was. And our heart mustn't be in who we are. It mustn't revolve all that we're who we are and, and, and the things that we do. Our heart needs to be for the vision that God gave us. And when we built this place, we were convinced God was giving us a vision, a vision to reach this area, to reach out with God's good news. And therefore, we need to keep hold of that. Building this building was not the end of the vision. It was only the start of it. When Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem, that, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the end of all what he did. That was only the beginning of the vision beginning to take form. And this building is only the beginning. And if we can't use it, then we'll use something else. You know, if Suzanne goes out to work in the garden and she's lost the wee scoop that she has, or she's lost the big scoop that Sean gave her that he bought it because it was half price, then she'd think of something else to use. She might think of using her hands or her plate. She might think of using something else that would do the job as well. The script's the best thing to use, but there's other things that you could use. And so this building, we're not able to use it very well at the minute. This is not the way that we would want it to be. Of course it's not. So we have to think of other ways in which we can reach out. And, and we've been trying to do that during lockdown as we've tried to do various things to touch the hearts of the people uh, in Sydney. And, and, and we'll talk about that maybe another time, but, but we won't do it. The third, the third characteristic that he had is when God gives us a vision, then we must seek his help. But we must also seek the help of other people. You know, God's not just going to give it to us. I was talking to somebody recently, and they said, God has given me a vision for East Belfast. It was yesterday I was talking to him. And he said, God has given me a vision that thousands will be saved. And I said, well, how are you going to go about it? But, well, well, God's given this to me, and this is how it's going to happen. But you see, Nehemiah sought God's help, and that's why he prayed. But he then also sought the help of the king. Because when the king said, what's wrong with you? He said, well, actually, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with me. Uh, this is a great job I have. But my heart is breaking because my people back in Jerusalem, the temple is rebuilt, but the walls are not in place, and therefore it is a wilderness. Anybody, wild animals and enemies can come into the city any time and ransack the temple. It's a terrible situation to be in. And he sought the help of the king. This king wasn't a Christian. This king was a pagan. This king worshipped other gods. But he sought his help to fulfill the vision. And therefore, in, in our ministry here, 
week there's people and there's government and there's social services and there's other organisations. We shouldn't be afraid. During lockdown, I, I sought the help of other organisations and we were able to, to feed. We were making 200 bowls of soup a week. We were able to give out some food parcels. We were able to do a number of things in this community and, and we did it alongside another organisation because they were well set up and, and we were able to help them bless other people. We need one another, and this church will not run just with God. The church will run with each one of us as we work together. The fourth thing is that we must develop a very realistic plan. It's not pie in the sky. It's not for dreamers. And the fifth thing, very, very carefully and very quickly, is that we must not be discouraged. Nehemiah had many, many, many opportunities to be discouraged, discouraged by his enemies, discouraged by the people he's working with, discover, uh, dis discouraged by the leadership within his group, it tells us here in Nehemiah 6, discouraged in so many ways. And for us to continue the work, we will always be discouraged. There's, there's time and time again, I can tell you many, many stories where I've spent hours, hours and hours and days and maybe weeks with different people and, and, and they were hoping to come to church and they never came. And that can be discouraging. Or, or, or you can be involved in various things and, 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 and it doesn't seem to work out the way that you'd hoped. And it's discouraging. And uh, since I came here, uh, I always said that I would do any funeral for anybody in this community, an opportunity for us to get to know. And during lockdown, uh, I've done over 15 funerals. And some of those were COVID-19. And we haven't seen any of those folk come to church at all. And it can be discouraging. But it's God's work, and we must not be discouraged. And in chapter 6, there's a wee verse in chapter 6, and with this I finish. It says, 52 days after Nehemiah started building the walls. These are the walls of the great city. Massive walls. Lots of discouraging. People were going to kill them. People were threatening to, 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 to kill them at night. People were threatening to steal from them. People were mocking them. Uh, his own people were... were, were doing things behind his back. All these things were happening. And in 52 days, 52 days, the walls were rebuilt. And it says the enemies of the people were afraid. And they were afraid because they realized it was God who rebuilt the walls. And we will be discouraged, but God's work will be done. And do you know why it will be done? Because it's God's work. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for this great man, Nehemiah. Help us to learn so much from him as we move forward uh, in this place. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us to be dissatisfied with what we see and help us to have a clear idea of where you're taking us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is, is the traditional version of Amazing Grace and will remain seated as we sing, just to remind you, there is an offering plate. We're not taking an offering. We've only got it there just in case you've brought some envelopes. That's the only reason it's there. We're, we're not having an offering. Thank you.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.